Some of you might not remember this, but when I first moved here to Cedar Rapids and started at what was Valley View Baptist Church at that point, um, you might have remembered I, I weighed a lot more than I do right now. Um, in fact, since that time, I've lost about 80 pounds. And unfortunately, throughout my life, I've struggled with weight a lot. Um, there was one other time in my life where I lost about 100 pounds and kept it off for about almost 10 years and then gained it back. And now I'm hopefully on a path that I can keep it off for longer. But when I, when I struggled with weight, you know, there was a few things that, that I, I had problems with. First of all, I didn't exercise much. And I ate bad food, and I ate a lot of it. And I found that as I would eat junk food or food that isn't very healthy, and as I would eat more and more of it, I felt horrible most of the time. I didn't have a lot of stamina. I would get tired very easily. Um, I, if I tried to exercise, I wouldn't make it very far because I just, it was really hard to do. And, and not only did I not have stamina, but just physically, I just felt tired and sluggish. And I had heartburn all the time. And what I've learned over the years is that eating unhealthy for me inevitably leads to health issues, makes me feel horrible. And it goes back to that old saying, garbage in, garbage out. And I've experienced that firsthand in my life. And I know how that can be a, a big issue for people. And, and that's true with our physical body. That what we put into our body, how we treat our body, will have either negative or positive effects. If I eat healthy, if I exercise, I feel better. I have more strength. I have more stamina. It's, it's just, that's just how it works. But the same is true in our spiritual life. If we fill our life with things of the flesh, and we're going to look today and see what Paul describes as things of the flesh. If we fill our lives with things of the flesh, it will be very difficult to walk in the Spirit. If we fill our lives with unrighteousness and ungodliness, and if we, we center our life around things that aren't godly or aren't spiritual, spiritually, we will be unhealthy. Spiritually, we will struggle. Spiritually, when the difficult times come, we might not have the stamina to keep going, to keep trusting, to keep holding on to God. And just like for our physical bodies, it's garbage in, garbage out, the same is true in our spiritual lives. And so today, as we continue on in our study of Galatians, Paul has kind of shifted the focus away from the theological understanding of what salvation means or how someone is saved. The, the beginning part of Galatians, Paul has been dealing with a false teaching that, that led the people in Galatia to believe they had to work for salvation. They had to do good things. And the, the exact uh, false teaching was they had to become Jewish in order to become Christian. They had, if they had to be circumcised, they had to follow the law, they had to do all of those works in order to be a Christian. And Paul is so clear and so upset that this church has fallen for this false teaching. He says, how can you, oh, he calls them foolish. He calls what they are, what the false teaching a curse. He says, this, this is not how someone knows God. And so he has dealt a lot with the theology of what salvation is, how salvation is by faith. It's apart from works. And when we are saved, we're justified, we're, we're redeemed. And he, he's gone through all of those things. But now at the end of the book, he is making it much more personal, much more applicational. What will salvation look like in our lives? 
What will be the result of God saving us, of God forgiving us, of God justifying us, declaring us innocent, of of Christ redeeming us, paying the price for our sins? How should that change our lives? And last week he talked about freedom and he said we can't use our freedom for the flesh. Because we've been set free, that doesn't mean we can now do whatever we want. We have freedom to keep sinning. We have freedom to rebel against God. We have freedom to live in the flesh. Paul's saying, no, that's not the freedom that Christ has given to us. We are free to love others. We should use our freedom to serve others. And today we're going to see that he is also going to show that the result of salvation, that freedom that we have in Christ should cause us to live in the spirit that God gives us. Today we are in Galatians 5 verses 16 through 25. Galatians 5, 16 through 25. And here we will see what life in the spirit looks like. And as we go through this passage, I think the point for us is to look at our lives and to evaluate our lives and to see whether we are living by the spirit or by the flesh to see whether we are filling our lives with things of the spirit or things of the flesh a a passage like this Paul is contrasting two things with the point of us looking inward and saying What am I doing in my life? And how can I use the freedom that God has given me to live in the Spirit? So let's look at verse 16, chapter 5, verse 16. Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Right from the beginning, he is showing the two different options, the two contrasting options. There's the flesh and the desires of the flesh, and there's the spirit. And every Christian, every believer has this struggle in their life to walk in obedience to God or fulfill the desires of the flesh. Even though our sins are forgiven through Christ, even though Christ has paid the price in full, we know that we still sin. We still struggle in our flesh. And the Bible describes a process of every believer. It's called sanctification. It's a process where we become more and more like Christ throughout our lives, but we will never reach the fullness of that sanctification until we're with Jesus. Up until that point, we all struggle. Up until that point, we all are fighting the fight of the flesh and the spirit. And just as we get started, just to be clear, I believe the spirit that Paul is talking about here is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we believe, is a member of the Trinity. We believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all fully God. They're all equally God. They are distinct. They are distinct persons, but they are equally one in God. And that the Spirit plays a very significant role in the life of the believer. You might remember Jesus, before he died, promised that he would leave a comforter to his followers, to his disciples. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. So part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to comfort followers. The scripture tells us that the Spirit indwells those who are, who are Christians. The Spirit lives inside of us and it is, it is a picture of the presence of God with us all the time. It is a picture of how God lives inside of us and, and in fact it says the Spirit is, is a seal which is like a down payment guaranteeing our deposit. The Spirit of God is, it, God places in our life to, to show us that he will do what he promised to do. The Spirit guides us. The Spirit fills us with wisdom and knowledge as we study Scripture. He guides us and directs us to understand spiritual things. The Spirit of God even convicts us of sin. And so Paul is saying to the believers here in Galatia, you have to choose whether to walk by the Spirit or to gratify the desires of the flesh. 
we're going to see that we can't have it both ways. We can't try to do both things. We can't try to fulfill the desires of the flesh and walk by the Spirit. That just doesn't work. And it is a choice every believer has to make. Look at verse 17. Paul says, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So here's, here's Paul saying what I was saying before. The spirit and the flesh are opposed to each other. They, they are not the same. They are not compatible. They are opposed to each other. And the flesh is working actively against the spirit to keep us from doing the things that God wants us to do. He goes on and says in verse 18, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And in verse 19, he starts to describe what the flesh looks like. He says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. I kind of like what Paul's saying there. He's saying, you know what the flesh looks like, right? I don't really need to explain this to you, do I? I mean, we know... That when people live in the flesh, it's, it's evident to everybody. But he, he gives us examples just to help us clear all of this up. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Sensuality. Idolatry. Sorcery. Enmity. Strife. Jealousy. Fits of anger. Rivalries dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. As we look at this passage, Paul wants the Galatian believers and and all believers, including us today, to understand that there is something that we all must do if we are going to live in the Spirit And that is point number one in our outline. We have to walk in the Spirit. We have to walk in the Spirit. We have to choose through the strength of God, through the help of God, because I really don't think we can do this on our own. We have to choose to follow the guiding of the Spirit of God in our life instead of the desires of the flesh. And let's be clear. The the desires of the flesh are things we want. The desires of the flesh are things we want. And the things we want are not the same things that God wants. The things that we want satisfy us. Other passages talk about the lust of the eyes, uh, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That, that these are things that we all struggle with. And I think as we look at this passage, Paul, Paul gives a wide range of things to show us what the flesh looks like. And just so we understand, you know, in order to live in the flesh, you don't have to do all of these things, right? There could just be one thing that is, that is in your life, that controls your life, that would make you live according to the flesh. This is just a list of a broad view of things, because Paul says at the end, and things like these. So this isn't a complete list, but it gives us an idea of what walking in the flesh looks like. And it is focused on self. It is focused on the individual. It is focused on desires. It talks about sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. That's, that's the desire to fulfill my, yourself, you know, through pleasure. And that is a temptation every person has. We want to make ourselves happy. We want to do what makes us feel good. But sometimes that is directly opposed to God's will in our life. 
He also describes things like idolatry and sorcery, false forms of religion, false forms of worship. And, and you know, the thing about especially sorcery and idolatry, usually those, those are things that are sometimes used to, to gain something for yourself. Sorcery, you know, the idea of using magical powers right, to, to get things you want. And even idolatry, although, you know, idolatry was, was focused on trying to appease a false god, many times it was all, often done to get the things you want from that god. You would bring sacrifices because you wanted that God to give something to you. You would go through certain rituals because you wanted that God to give you rain for your crops or maybe, maybe allow your, your, your spouse or your wife to have children. You know, there were, there were things for themselves. But it's not just those sensual desires. It's not just those false forms of worship. At, in verse 20... It says enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Where do those things come from? Why are people angry at each other all the time? Why are people fighting all the time? We live in a world where this is, this, we, we know what this is like. We live in a place where people are angry. We live in a country and a time where everybody is angry at everybody else. There's strife, there's anger, there's division, there's dissension. Where does that come from? It comes from the flesh. And I, and I think this is something that's really important for us as Christians. To understand that what we see in the world around us, all of the anger, that's not from God. That's from our flesh. And we are so tempted sometimes, and I know this, we are so tempted to, to join in in that anger and division. We are so tempted to, to be drawn into those, to those things that surround us in our country and in our nation and in our world. But Scripture points us back to the things that we need to understand those things are what come from the flesh when we want things. When we desire things. And we don't care if it hurts other people to get them. We are going to fight for what's ours. And God warns us. That those desires come from the flesh. And not from the spirit of God. Paul is very pointed in saying at the end of the passage, the people who do these things do not, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let's understand in context what Paul is saying here. He's not saying, if you've ever had a fit of anger, you're not going to heaven. You know, that's not what he's saying, thank the Lord, because we would all be going to hell, right? Um, He's not saying that we will never mess up as Christians. He's not saying that if you sin once, that's it, you're done. What he's saying is, the people who live like this, the people who, who follow the flesh, that is representative of people who don't know God. And Paul is going to, in the next part of this passage, very clearly say, that's not how Christians should live. We shouldn't live in the flesh. We shouldn't follow the desires of the flesh. We shouldn't be controlled by the flesh. We shouldn't allow the flesh to fill our minds with anger, to fill our minds with selfishness, to fill our minds with jealousy and envy and, and all of these things that, that describe someone who doesn't know God. If we are to walk in the Spirit, the things we have to turn away purposefully in our life with the help of the Spirit of God, turn away from the flesh. Because the flesh and the Spirit don't mix. Now we've all heard the 
the saying, oil and water don't mix, right? And it's true. Right? Have, you, have you tried to mix oil and water? I thought about bringing some today, but I figured I would just make a mess, so I decided just to leave it at home. But, uh, you know, when you take oil and you take water and you put them together and you mix them up and you shake them up and you spin it all together, what happens? If you give it a few seconds, the oil goes to the top and the water sinks to the bottom. Now, why is that? Why can't water and oil mix together? Okay, the, the density. But it's even more than that. I'm going to give you a little science lesson. I'm not a science teacher, so if I get this wrong, don't blame me. I got it off the internet, so blame the internet. But this is, this is what I found. It said that the reason oil and water don't mix is because um, the structure of the molecules of oil and water. Water is something that's called a polar molecule. And what that means is that there is a positive charge on one end of the water molecule and a negative charge on the other end of the water mo molecule. So what happens is water molecules are attracted to each other because of that positive and negative charge. And because of that positive and negative charge, one end of the water mo molecule, because it's positive, is attracted to the negative end of another water molecule. And so, you know, think of almost like magnets, right? How magnets, certain, certain parts of the magnet, the positive or negative, they, they, they cling together, they stick together. But oil is something completely different. Oil does not ha is not a polar molecule. Um, oil is nonpolar which means its charge is evenly balanced around the whole molecule. So what happens is oil is attracted, oil molecules are attracted to other oil molecules because of how they are made, because of how, how, how it is. And water is the same way. And so when you put them together, they don't mix because of the charge of the molecules. And what I think is cool about that is that when you get down to the smallest features of what makes water water and what makes oil oil, the very essence of what they are doesn't mix together. And that's the same thing as the flesh and the spirit. There's no compromise between the flesh and the spirit. There's no middle ground between the flesh and the spirit. They are opposed to each other. You can't mix them. You can't satisfy the desires of the flesh and walk in the spirit of God at the same time. But what is really amazing is that when we walk in the spirit, when we submit to God and God's will, something amazing happens. Where when we follow and walk along with the Spirit, the desires of our heart change. And remember the passage that tells us that God will give us the desires of our heart. That's not the desires of our flesh. That's the desires that are conformed to the will of God. So as we walk with God, as we walk in the Spirit, as we're filled by the Spirit, as we live in the Spirit, it changes us who, from who we are from the inside out. In Romans, it tells us, do not be conformed to this world. That's the desires of the flesh. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The whole idea is that God will transform us from the inside out. He will renew our mind. He will change the way we think. He will change our desires. But we cannot conform to this world. We cannot walk in the flesh. We cannot fulfill the desires of the flesh if we're going to follow God. And so the question for all of us today is, does the list here describe parts of my life? Are there things in my life that fit the list of the flesh? 
Are there ways in which I'm walking by the flesh and not by the Spirit? And just so we can understand clearly, the next part of the passage describes what life in the Spirit looks like. So in case you're confused, in case you're not sure, Paul showed us the flesh, but now he's going to show us the Spirit. And the evidence of the Spirit in our life, or the fruit of the Spirit, what that looks like in the life of believers. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. In these verses, I think we see something very similar. I, we talked about what it means to walk in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit means that we have to, we have to deny the, the desires of the flesh. But in this passage, it, talks, it describes what it means to live in the Spirit. That when we live in the Spirit, when we, when we keep in step with the Spirit, the Spirit changes us and it results in things that sometimes we've never experienced before. It talks about what happens when the Spirit of God fills our life, when we walk, when we keep in step, when we live by the Spirit of God, the result of that is love. And we could spend all morning talking about biblical love because the Bible focuses a lot on love. The Bible describes love as selfish, selflessness. The Bible describes love as thinking about others instead of yourself. For example, Jesus says the greatest commandment, first of all, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. To serve your neighbor to care about your neighbor, to put your neighbor and their needs before your needs. We know Jesus says that love is a fulfillment of the law. In fact, we saw that last week where, where he said in, in Galatians, um, uh, the passage is slipping my mind now. I think it was 514. I might be wrong about that. But he talked about how, how we, f through love, we fulfill the law. Jesus says that, uh, that you will know that you are my disciples by your love. Love is so important to the believer. And I think what we see here is that true love, biblical love, comes about through the Spirit of God. We need God's spirit in our life to love like God wants us to love. To serve as God wants us to serve. To have joy. Joy is another key that the New Testament focuses on. That, that we are to have joy no matter what. We are to rejoice always. We are to have joy in our trials. We are to have joy in persecutions. We are to, to have joy. Not, and I, it's important for us to understand, joy doesn't mean happiness. That doesn't mean we, we need to be happy and, and smile and all the time. Joy is different than happiness. Joy is, is more than just an emotion. I think joy is the choice. We have to choose to rejoice always. We have to choose to rejoice in our trials. We have to choose to trust God. 
to believe God, to know that God is doing something in our life. Those passages that's, that tell us to rejoice in our trials in James, it tells us why should we ha consider it all joy when we fall into various trials? Because God is doing something in our life. It goes on to say, God is producing these things in your life and these things will produce these other things in your life. And as a result, you will be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So what we, joy is, is seeing things from God's perspective, understanding that God even uses trials in our life to bring about maturity and completeness and wholeness in him. But that joy will never come if we focus on the flesh. We will never be full of joy if we do what we desire in our flesh to do. Peace. Spirit gives us peace. And we live in a world that is full of chaos, full of fear, full of anger. And yet God gives his people peace through his spirit. We could spend so much time just looking at each one of these different descriptions of the fruit of the spirit, different characteristics of the fruit of the spirit. And I think part of it describes the choices that we make to love, to put others first, the choice that we make to, to have joy and trust God in our circumstances. And it also describes how we treat other people. That we're gentle. That we're kind. That we're self-controlled. And none of us will ever, until we're with Christ, demonstrate these things fully and completely. I know I fall short all the time. But the Spirit of God changes the people of God. And if we live by the Spirit, it means we have to keep in step with the Spirit. It means we have to follow the Spirit. It, it doesn't mean we can just sit where we are and say, Spirit, fill me. Spirit, do what it... No, no, we have to actively follow and pursue the Spirit of God. When, um, when I was growing up, many of you know I grew up in New York. And, and as a result, as a kid, we would go to New York City on and off. And I did, did a lot of things in the city growing up. Um, then when I went to college, we lived close to the city and, and w went into New York City to do all kinds of things. But one year, um, my college took a college group into the city around Christmas time. And it was a part of one of our classes. Uh, it was like a, a fine arts class where we would go in and go to museums and do tours and things like that. And we also had some free time. So a group that I was with decided to go to Rockefeller Center. Now, you've all seen Rockefeller Center on TV, right? It's a, it always looks so beautiful, and, and it often looks like there's nobody there. That's not how it is in real life. It is, especially around Christmas time, it is packed with people. And in our group, there were a lot of different people. There were people like me who kind of grew up around a big city and were comfortable in a big city. And there were people who had never, this was the first time they'd ever been to New York City. Some people who grew up in, in a small country town and, and the city was just overwhelming to them. And so we got to this place and it was just packed, sardine-like with people. And some of the people were getting very scared because they were afraid that we would get separated. They were afraid that somehow the crowd would push us apart, which it could have very easily done because... It was, it was a huge crowd and everybody was pushing and jostling and, and, and so what happened was we all grabbed each other's shoulders. We grabbed onto each other and it looked kind of weird, but we wanted to make sure that we stayed together and nothing separated us. So all throughout walking through Rockefeller Center, we were just grabbing onto each other walking together so we could get through this crowd. And as I was looking at this passage, I kind of thought about that today. I thought about, you know, how, 
sometimes to walk with the Spirit means we're just, we're just holding on for dear life, right? We, we don't know what's going on. We're in this mass of confusion, this world that doesn't make sense, this, all of the evil and wickedness we see around us, and we don't know what to do. And sometimes we just have to cling to the Spirit. Sometimes, sometimes walking in the Spirit means we kind of give up of, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. We, we give up trying to make sense of everything and we just hold on to the Spirit of God and walk in trust, knowing that the person in the front knows what they're doing. The Spirit knows. And I'm just along for the ride. To walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, requires a few things. It requires that we actively deny the flesh. And it also requires that we actively cling to God. It requires that we give up some of our will, some of our, sometimes some of our desires, and trust and follow God. But here's the thing. When we do this, what God does in our life is fill our lives with love and joy and peace. And I really think there's nothing better. There's nothing better that we could ever ask for than for the Spirit of God to change us, to transform us, to give us love in an unloving world. To give us joy in a world that's full of pain and despair. To give us peace in the midst of chaos and confusion. To change us. And after Paul describes what it means to walk in the spirit, the very last part of, of this passage is he says, let's not be conceited. <laughs> he says, okay. Okay. Above all, we need humility. We can't think that we're great. We can't become conceited. We can't provoke each other. We, we have to continue to focus on the Spirit of God because that's how we grow. And that's what a life transformed by the power of salvation. That's what happens. Once Christ saves us, once Christ redeems us, He's done it for a purpose so that we could walk in line with the Spirit. And so today, as you look at your life, I know we all have areas where we fall short. We all have areas where the flesh, where the flesh has an upper hand. And we fight it, but it's hard. And sometimes the flesh wins. And sometimes more often than not, the flesh wins. And I think the purpose of this passage is not to, to make us all feel guilty how often we fail because we all fail. I think the point of this passage is to remind us to keep fighting the fight, to keep trusting, to keep clinging, to not give up, to not give in to the flesh. And we are all tempted to give up. As we look at this passage, we, we are reminded that Jesus paid such a wonderful price so that we could be set free. And that freedom is so that we can walk with him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I pray for all of us as we struggle in this life, as we struggle against the flesh, as we fall, as we sin, I pray in those times, Lord, that we will seek you. I pray that you will help us to keep in, to walk in line with your spirit. I pray that your spirit will transform us and change us from the inside. And I pray that you will fill our lives with love, joy, and peace. We thank you for these promises, Lord, and we just ask that you would help us.
Help us, Lord, as we seek to walk with you. In your name we pray, amen.